the excavations in the Rock Springs Chinatown, um, I'll probably catch us up with this. Uh, the excavations in Rock Springs Chinatown begin in 1983. And um, it's a complicated site. If you look at the rich texture of these houses that were, were rebuilt after 1885, you can see this, the dirt that was pushed up against the house to keep the wind from coming in. It's a very cold and windy climate, Rock Springs is. And it had a large population of Chinese there. One time, 600 uh, people worked in the mines and we know this because of the fact that there was a lot of investigations undertaken surrounding the Chinese massacre of September 2nd, 1885. This provides basically a breakdown of a timeline of things that occurred in the Rock Springs Chinatown. Chinese were recruited to work in the mines in 1874. Chinatown was constructed shortly thereafter. And on September 2nd, 1885, the Chinatown was attacked. 28 Chinese miners were killed. And uh, it's, the Chinatown is burned to the ground. The people's goods that were inside the house were robbed. It enriched a lot of the neighbors, and that's even said by the historians in the area. So that the people that were charged with the murders, 16 of them were charged with riot, murder, uh, arson, and uh, uh, robbery. So the robbery was real important for changing people's lives in the community, unfortunately not the Chinese. The Chinese were tricked into returning to Rock Springs. The mines were essential to the operation of the Transcontinental Railroad. They had been moved to Evanston, and I think by their own volition, and there's arguments about this, multiple arguments, because technically the people that victimized the Chinese, that killed the Chinese, wanted to become the heroes, and they wanted to change the narrative, which is a common thing that happens in mob violence. And because so many people are involved in the mob violence, there's a lot of people that buy into the alternate narrative, and that really happens in the, in the Rock Springs Chinatown. The Chinese did insist on having military troops or sheriffs go with them and accompany them, and they returned, and within 30 days, they rebuilt the Chinatown. So Chinatown is rebuilt within a month. Not all 60 buildings get bit up, but enough get built at that point in time that the Chinese are able to move in by the end of September. You have to do that. It's too cold in Wyoming to live outside in a tent through the entire winter, though people do do that. Um, Camp Pilot Butte was built by the military at the same time, so there's a lot of activity on the north side of Bitter Creek. And then in, from 1912 to 1913, they started to subdivide Chinese as the Chinese staged out. The Exclusion Act had, its, had an impact on the coal miners in the area. So Rock Springs is located in southwestern Wyoming, where the trees end and the wind begins. It's not quite, the wind starts at the border. Um, and the residents of Chinatown that, were, that had been victimized by the riot returned. And some of those people lived in Rock Springs to the 1920s. In fact, we now have real good accounts of people's lives post massacre, which is real important and real important in, to identify in the archaeological record. This is an 1883 contour map of the Chinatown, and I don't know if, if you can see this, but it's in the northern part of, if you can see where my mouse is at, you can see the Chinatown that's there in 1883. This is the one that is burned. Um, this is Bitter Creek right here, and it doesn't show the extension of the Chinatown down to Bitter Creek. That will be rerouted right through this old Chinatown in the 1920s. But it was north. This is the only map that we have of the, of the Chinatown that was burned. Uh, now, when they came back and rebuilt it, they filled in the cellars that were inside of this. And I'm not going to read this whole quote from the Cheyenne Democrat, but they said the, unsight, the uh, cellars were filled in and then the space was made level. And this is real important for the archaeological record. It said nearly everyone had a cellar prior to 1885 and no one had a cellar after 1885. True on the first count, not on the second count. As soon as everybody left and the builders were gone, they began to dig cellars back into the ground. This is the new Chinatown. And if you look at it here, here are the military barracks. And here is the new Chinatown that's constructed almost overnight. And up here is where Bitter Creek is rechanneled. This is the original channel of Bitter Creek. This 1908 map, sorry, it's going a little bit too fast there. This 1908 USGS map also shows where the Chinatown is in relationship to railroad tracks and to Bitter Creek. I've got to watch what I do here. I'm not comfortable yet with the modem. Okay, so here you see this USGS map from 1908. It shows a Chinese cemetery and it shows the Chinatown. Ultimately, both of these vanish. Um, on the Sanborn map, so sometimes have a few Chinatown dwellings like you see in this, this slide above, but they don't show the Chinatown. Uh, it's because it's Union Pacific property and I think Union Pacific told Sanborn you may not map them. We do have Union Pacific maps, so this 1904 map provides the best map of the area, and it provides a robust uh, understanding of where, where, where buildings were located at. The one thing that the paper says is that they're located at, at a distance from one another, 
And I think this was done as a prevention for fire sweeping through the Chinatown and uh, making it a little bit different, make it a little bit different configuration. The, the houses were all built on a standard building plan and each addition that you see on this map was made by Chinese people living in the house so they had expanded area. 10 people were assigned to each house according to the newspapers of the time. In 1913, 1912, 1913, they begin to dismantle Chinatown. Um, the first two things that appear in this 1912 map you see here is a public school. And that public school creates a large footprint on the ground. This makes it very difficult to discern and excavate in an area where you're trying to isolate where the Chinese massacre remnants are or where subsequent occupations are. Because everybody that moves into this area after 1912 digs and excavates and, and makes modification to the, 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 the archaeological record. The formative process of this site is complex and I'll go into that in a little bit further. You see the public school that's placed on top of Chinatown. You see China Avenue is still there. That will change to Bridger Street. And you see the foundation for a Catholic church that's placed there. The Catholic church is directly beside Chinese houses. In 1991, we excavated the house shown here in this arrow. And this is what Ryan Kennedy has done the analysis for the bone from. And it's phenomenal. Without Ryan, I don't know what I would do. Um, by 1920, the Sandborn map begins to show a new configuration of the area. Osei Avenue is right here. The public school is enlarged. Our archaeological excavations will be focused in this area here, but what happens is each of these houses has a tendency to mask the archaeological record. I purchased this house right here because of the fact that I was on the review board for National Register Sites and everybody said, oh, there's nothing left in this area, and I purchased this house. It was the right price and did excavations in my backyard, and this is a Chinese house right here that we've preserved. I subsequently sold that um, just because of the nature of things that go. But if you look at this, these are the remaining houses in Chinatown that are there until the school is built in 1971. And that again has an impact on the archeological footprint. Here's the church, here's the school, a new school you build right here. Both of these schools are called Washington School. What you see in this white, in, in the white here is the mine voids. Um, you see the hallways, you see where they need to fill us in. What happened is this is a public park and there is a school there to the north that's not shown in this picture, to the north and it subsides. From the surface to the mine is 100 feet. That subsidence creates a whole lot of problem. And the worst part of it is, is Rock Springs is named after the springs that are there. Everybody says they've seen the rocks, but never the springs. And that causes a plunging effect of the water rising and sinking in the soil going down. It damages the archeological record, it damages houses, something had to be done. So this year they decided to infill this whole area. This map here shows previous um, archeological excavations. This right here is supposedly the 1971 excavation area, which was done by amateurs. But I actually think that most of it was focused here. This right here is where we did the 1990, 1991 excavation. And this is our 2021 excavations here. Unfortunately, on this map that you have right here where you see gray, and that's the wrong color for me to have chosen, shame on me, I should have gone with yellow. That is where in the monitoring of the infilling of those holes, we found uh, cultural material. The most cultural material came down here from Teasdale Avenue. I just cannot use this, I'll try something else. Came from down here on Teasdale Avenue and we knew that there was a structure. So we subsequently said we needed to do excavation in this particular area. Now, just for review, these are the artifacts that came from the 1971 excavation done either when they were building the school or tearing down the Washington School. But there was a broad sweep of artifacts, and you can see everything that you would normally find within a, a Chinese excavation was found in the 1971 excavations, but it was done by amateurs. There's no written record. The 1991 record, 1991 record is, more, uh, is more tightly, it was done by professionals and a few volunteers, is more tightly uh, organized and it's also done by with rigor. You've got everything mapped and measured. You've got everything uh, done in the proper form. So the 1991 excavations actually cover the line floors of the basements of the houses, the ones that they weren't supposed to put back in the houses. We found floors in the basements of the houses that they reconstructed post 1885. And we found wonderful, beautiful bones. At 436 Bridger, the house that I showed you that was purchased, we also found bones. We were able to tell a little bit more about the dietary patterns that are there. The house in the upper corner right here is a Chinese house. This is the, these are the prescribed Chinese houses that were built. The additions that were added to these were added later and it's part of subsequent occupation. Now, the primary area of focus, the primary place where the Chinese massacre took place is on Ase Avenue, which is named after one of the principal Chinese men 
in the area. The white building right here, this school right here was built on top of Chinatown and that area that I showed that had not been disturbed. And this is where we think most of the artifacts came from, from the 1971 excavation. So they did come from the school. The school was expansive. Um, this is the church in the background right here. The school was expansive when we did our excavation. The idea was to try to identify the strata that was here. The unfortunate or fortunate part of what we did was we came into one of the streets in Chinatown, which I really do like, by the way. Uh, we were able to find out that they had leveled it after the burn in 1885. That part of the newspaper report is correct. They leveled it. But here what they did was they spread the refuse, refuse all, all across the street. So you have the 1874 straight that you can see real clearly, 18, through 1885. And then you have the 18, post-1885 straight right above it. And then the 1912 construction. And that's construction material. That's mortar. And then the school horizon. And I like the school horizon. We found pencils and kids' toys, and it was kind of really unique. But we did this in five centimeter levels. We excavated naturally, but we did it in five centimeter levels. So we were able to tease out real precisely where things were located at. That 1885 horizon is one of the streets inside of Chinatown. You can see the burn across there, but that's all the way across the entire area. What I'd like to suggest is that no matter how much vandalism, no matter how much damage has been done to a site, there's always subsequent scientific data that can be gleaned from that area, but you have to do meticulous, very difficult work, which we all do. All archaeologists are hard workers, or they wouldn't be in the field very long. Um, these are the items that we recovered this summer. And the interesting thing is that they're small. That's what you'd expect to find inside of a street or the outside of a structure that has high activity. Um, all of them were small, but they're all, as you know, everybody that's familiar with Chinese artifacts, see the kaolin pieces, the utility wares, and some of the, the, the ceramics there, they're all very small. But we also found pieces of go, and we found this particular item in it, right here that is a jewelry piece that's off of a tooth. Now, I don't even know what to suggest the tooth is, but it had a drill hole in the tooth, and then you see a resin that was used to fasten it. So I think that was part of a necklace that was made. The real interesting thing that we also see at uh, Evanston is that after the massacre, the Chinese armed themselves. So in the post-1885 excavation units, we find a lot of ballistics. This is a 32 caliber uh, casing. And so the Chinese are not passive in this process. And in fact, I am very fascinated by the individuals who decided to stay in Rock Springs from 1885 to 1927, when at an older age, they returned home with a retirement from Union Pacific. Uh, in addition to the items that we recovered that, were, that you just saw, we also found bone and Ryan tentatively identified this as pig bone. And I, uh, he hasn't seen it, I haven't mailed it to him yet, but we'll just go with what we know from these photographs. And then he has found in this particular area in Chinatown, sea trout, which is very fascinating. He's doing the genetic studies. He's also done the acetobic studies on it so that we know what the pigs ate. And I'm stopping with this slide and ending this discussion here because in what Ryan's done and what he looks at the microanalysis of these things and just takes out what we find and looks at the greater data, he also knows that these pigs were eating uh, corn, they were corn fed. You could see that there wasn't too many corn plants around, <laughs> but it was imported food that the Chinese were taking good care of their animals and they were selling them and they're making quite a bit of money. The other thing that happens is these people that lived here were taxed and they have a poll tax. And because the poll tax, we know for a fact that these individuals, how many individuals are there outside of census years? Because as we know, the 10 year issues of the census is, important, is, an, is an important issue. These poll taxes are not for voting. These poll taxes are just like an income tax. And we also know that these uh, individuals in this area were taxed for houses, not inside the Union Pacific place, because the one thing that they didn't do is double tax and Union Pacific was being taxed for the Chinese houses. But right at the fringes of this, the Chinese um, people who lived there were paying property taxes. They were never allowed to, to file a deed on it. I spent all day yesterday looking this up, so I know this for a fact. They were never able to file a deed on it, but they had to pay property taxes and use taxes. That's an aside from what I'm saying right here, but the Chinatown in Rock Springs still contains a lot of information that we need to ferret out and go through. Because what it's done, the excavation in Chinatown has enlightened us to look for smaller pieces of data in the data sets. Like we didn't even think about the polling tax because we didn't even know that there was a polling tax for the Chinese in the area. That gives us demographic data. But by looking at the small things left behind and by having great archeologists that help us and assist us because there's very little money in this process, um, we've been able to learn a lot, and I want to end by thanking uh, Laura Ng and, and, and Paul and Peter Lau and uh, uh, 
my friends, the Leos, for helping us with this project because they provided invaluable assistance. And I know I've annoyed him by saying, what does this mean? Because my Chinese is so bad. Even though I've been working on my Chinese since 1972, you just can't teach an old dog new tricks. Thank you very much.